Thank you, President Hinton, members of the Board of Trustees, esteemed members of the faculty, supportive parents, grandparents, siblings, and any other family members you guys could scalp tickets for. Thank you for sharing this exceptional day with me, and congratulations. More importantly, however, congratulations to the women sitting in front of me, the College of St. Benedict graduating class of 2017. One of the first things I learned at St. Ben's was that we were to refer to ourselves as women, not girls, gals, or ladies, if we did not want to. We were women. That was a distinct moment for me. There is courage in identifying who you are and then saying it out loud. To this day, I freely and openly correct people when they refer to me as a girl, and it happens. This school was life-changing for me. 20 years ago to this day, I was sitting right where you are, right where you are, right there. I'd grown up in a small Minnesota town, go Blue Jackets, in the country with two self-employed artists as parents. And while the life of an artist certainly instills in you the belief that you should do both what makes you happy and what you believe will change the world, it is not exactly stable or wealthy. I grew up eating free lunch, wearing handed down and not branded jeans, and I typically had patches on the knees of my snow pants, which I promptly stuffed into my backpack because I was mortified at the heart-shaped patches on my knees. I grew up with a single dad, and then a second mom, and then a second mom who battled cancer. And through all of it, my father insisted, it's right over there, I could do anything. So I was obviously going to college. I knew my attendance, however, would only be possible through focus on my grades, my extracurriculars, and my community. And somehow, I stitched it all together through the generosity of others with grants, scholarships, and lots and lots of loans. I tell you this because sitting where you are on my graduation day remains one of the most meaningful moments of my life. Not because the commencement speaker left an indelible print on me, I'm sorry Susan Mondale, but I forgot who you were and I had to look you up at the St. Ben's archives. <laughs> it was because I was right where I wanted to be. I felt poised to take on life. It was because I fundamentally believed that St. Ben's had given me the best possible skills, attributes, and moral compass and I was prepared as I was going to be. Now to be fair, I may not have articulated all that in the moment, but I see it clearly in hindsight. Fast forward 20 years, and so it was that President Hinton visited my office this fall. This past year has been kind of a big one for me. In June of 2016, I was appointed Chief Financial Officer of Best Buy, number 71 on the list of Fortune's 500 largest companies. A lot has come with that, including articles, accolades, and interviews. In all those moments, however, there has only been one that has literally made me cry the moment that President Hinton asked me to be the commencement speaker. And then somewhere between her asking and this moment here on stage, it hit me. She'd asked me to speak for some reason, some purpose, and I was completely at a loss for what sage words I could possibly provide. Over the past several months, I've had a chance to meet with a number of Bennies and Johnnies, and I was quite certain that I could learn more from them, from you, than I could ever impart. Let me tell you, when you actually sit down and think about how to articulate wisdom, it gets daunting quickly. And so, I did what any corporate finance nerd like me would do. I research. You start reading the greatest commencement speeches of all time. They're on the NPR website, there's 350 of them, and I found myself angry they didn't just power rank them from the best to the worst. <laughs> you look at the role models around you and you start to think about what makes them great. You ask your husband, a Johnny, about what great advice you've given him recently, and he just looks at you funny, wondering what the catch is. <laughs> and then it hit me. I am who I am today, in large part due to my time at St. Ben's. My time with President Hinton made me realize this. In fact, President Hinton and I really hit it off. I really love her. I feel like we were like separated at birth or something. <laughs> She's helped craft the vision for the future of St. Ben's, and it boils down to preparing women to Think critically, lead courageously, advocate passionately. Six words, six. 
think critically, lead courageously, advocate passionately. Little secret, corporate leadership teams would kill to boil their vision down to six words. And here's the truth. I believe in all my heart in those six words. I believe that's what made me successful. What will make you successful is a combination of those attributes, your support systems like your coworkers, family, and friends, and your very own roadmap yet to be created. First, think critically. It's so easy for me to just say that's my job. It's what I do every day. I critically assess financials to deliver the best possible results. I know that sounds fascinating. It is, however, a lot more than that. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, in the Fortune 500, there are 69 female CFOs, 500 companies, 69 women lead finance. There are 21 female CEOs, and only 14% of the top five jobs at these companies are held by women. This is all against a backdrop where more than half of all business undergraduate degrees go to women. Thinking critically has always been a cornerstone of a St. Ben's liberal arts education. I remember walking into my freshman peace studies class that a young Jeff Anderson was leading. We couldn't figure out if he was a student or the teacher. Our first assignment, a paper outlining our point of view on a controversial subject. Now remember, I was a straight A's high school student. I rocked my ACTs and I loved standardized testing. I built a whole paper around what I thought was expected of me following every rule of the law. Upon return, that paper was covered in more red feedback than any paper I had ever received in my relatively short paper writing history. It was not read because Jeff disagreed with my point of view. It was read because my point of view was woefully light on critical thinking, falling back on years of what I thought I was supposed to do. I became a better student and leader because these professors pushed me to think critically and courageously express my thoughts. More on that in a minute. I was not sitting in the audience 20 years ago thinking of my life as a CFO. I wasn't thinking that someday I'd have a big corporate job. I was just thinking about starting. I wanted to get started. The thing is, you kind of start your career by yourself, but your life is made up of thousands of interactions with others. Your career is made not just because you think critically, it's made because others around you think critically and teach you. In 1999, I had an interview at the Best Buy corporate campus with Ann Lowry, an amazing woman that immediately inspired me with her passion and her competence. I decided to leave my job in public accounting and go to Best Buy because I thought I could learn from her, not because I love TVs, but I do. And I did learn from her. In fact, I still do as our paths cross regularly at Best Buy. She taught me so much, including the true art of mentorship and developmental feedback. In my 17 years at Best Buy, I've received more feedback than you can imagine. It's like giving an oral exam every day. You grow when you can sift through all that and constantly, critically, think about both the leader you want to be and the path you want to take. At Best Buy, our executive team is half female. Our board of directors is almost half female compared to 20% of Fortune 500 board members being female on average. I have the advantage of being surrounded by incredible women every day, just like I was at St. Ben's. They push me, make me better, advise me, and help me think more critically than I ever could think by myself. Before she left, the prior CFO and my boss, Sharon McCollum, was both my biggest advocate and my harshest critic. She did this only because she had aspirations for me and wanted me to be better. She also knew that my empowered, critical mind would drive unique and exceptional results, not just for the company, but for me personally. Find those around you who do not just agree with you, but will push you and challenge you to be better. Think critically. Next, lead courageously. 80 years ago, in 1937, my grandma began college at the University of Minnesota. She wanted to be an elementary school teacher, one of the few degrees that were offered to women at that time. She jumped into college like she leapt into all things in her life with full vigor and dedication. It all sounds pretty simple now, but remember, this was against the backdrop of the Great Depression. Her parents were a little less than pleased that she didn't just get married and get supported versus spending money. This did not deter my grandma, and few things do. She dedicated herself to a life of teaching young children. She's touched more lives as a result of her courageous start than I ever will. 
At 97, she can recall all the details of her dedication to education and still sits with my children, teaching them to read. Leading courageously will look different for each of you. Tip of the cap to Cheryl Sandberg here. She often refers to data and studies, things CFOs love, that highlight two key facts. First, when compared to men, women underestimate their performance, invariably self-ranking their personal and professional performance lower than their male peers. Second, and compounding this, men are in the college-educated part of the population, men are seen as more ambitious than women, articulating their aspirations more boldly. Ladies. There's a big difference between being a braggart and advocating for yourself. Be courageous. I'm sure you can all agree with me when I say leading courageously is hard. I've made mistakes at work, and when I make mistakes, it's very public. I can be so afraid of making mistakes that I start to lose my ability to lead courageously. I play a game with my kids called, what's the worst thing that could happen? When my son Parker, he's back there, was trying out for travel basketball, he was having a bit of stress about it. 90 kids trying out for only 50 or so spots can really test a little 10-year-old psyche. So I decided to play a game with him. I asked him, what's the worst thing that could happen? The answer is he'd play recreational basketball with his friends, have a great time, and learn skills. Not too bad. I told him I need to think that way too. On my very worst days at work, I have to remember I have an amazing family, incredible support network, I'm in good health, and I have a fantastic education. Pretty darn good, all in all. Parents and family members stepping in as parents. As a parent myself of two amazing elementary age children, I literally have no idea what it feels like to sit where you are. Years of memories likely flooding back. All that pride and perhaps some anxiety wanting only the best always for your daughter. When I was pregnant, a friend told me once, having a child is like wearing your heart on the outside of your chest. I found that being a parent is leading courageously every day. My family, including my parents, is what allows me to lead courageously. My grounding what I see as important is what allows me to lead courageously. I believe my very humanity is what allows me to lead courageously. The Pope recently gave a TED Talk, and you know the world is changing when the Pope gives a TED Talk. In it, he said, tenderness is not weakness, it is fortitude. It is the path of solidarity, the path of humanity. Leading courageously is not always about being out in front storming the hill. It's not about being the leader, it's about being a leader. For me, that means being a real sensitive human in all parts of my life, including my work. Look around for a second. At least part of your family is likely in this room with you. They know you have something amazing to give the world, and they will always be there for you. Have courage. What's the worst thing that could happen? Finally, advocate passionately. At Best Buy, we talk a lot about our purpose. And I don't mean in the corny, what are we here to do as a retailer sense. I mean our personal, individual purpose. The reason we come to work every day. The thing that drives us. It can be a hard question to answer. What is your purpose? I believe I am here to be a steward. I am here to leave the company, my family, the world a better place than when I found it. I try to live that way every day in all that I do. You all have a purpose. And I'd recommend that you take a moment and really think about that. A big part of my support system is my eight closest college girlfriends back there somewhere. I've had a recurring meeting on my calendar for happy hour with these women for the last decade. I'm reminded on the first Thursday of every month that I need to take some time out of my life and see my roommates and friends. The group has evolved a bit over time and now it's more often a brunch because of our hectic schedules, but we usually see each other at least once a month, often celebrating birthdays. They keep me grounded, inspired, and humble. Upon the news of my promotion, I should have known the first text message I would get was from the girl's text message string reading simply, well, we know who's picking up the tab at the next happy hour. Like all Bennies, we are a diverse group. We all advocate incredibly passionately, but incredibly differently. Erin is a middle school language arts teacher. That is her title. What she does is a different story. She's been known to take students to the optometrist to buy them glasses because it's clear they cannot see and they're falling behind in class, and their family obviously cannot afford to do so. 
Angie is a realtor driving her own business and defining her own future. She also devotes countless hours to an education nonprofit that teaches middle and high school students how to think about, discuss, and act on complex world issues often missed in standardized curriculum. Jeannie is a manager at Grain Corp selling the raw goods that are used to make beer. She is also the most exceptional connector of people I have ever met, using her vast network to connect others to jobs, resources, and countless opportunities, and even a marriage or two, I believe. Anne is the policy coordinator at the Association of Minnesota Counties. She advocates every day for social services funding, often specifically aimed at creating jobs for the underserved. Tina is guest experience director at a nonprofit educational retreat center located in the rainforest of East Hawaii Island. She helps visitors find both personal and professional meaning far away from their daily lives, but she does miss most happy hours. Missy is Assistant VP Senior Performance Coach. She spends her days coaching and training others, both professionally, but also for many of us personally, where she also leverages the wide network she created through her time at United Way and other nonprofits to advocate for the disenfranchised. Tony is an audiovisual specialist at an organization that operates one of the world's largest real-time energy markets. Her passion, though, is art, and five of her paintings hang on my walls, a reminder of her exceptional talent. And my best friend in the world, Angie, works here at St. Ben's as the Director of Experiential Learning and Community Engagement. Her passion around this school has turned into a career. She works every day to help students engage in the community around them, and she has inspired countless students to take on challenges and careers they never considered. 20 years ago, we were all where you are with majors that range from French studies to math, art history, and English. We didn't know where our roadmap would take us. I imagine you're all wondering where your roadmap is going to take you. I say all this only to reinforce, there is no wrong path if you love what you do and then advocate passionately. Look at us, our dreams and aspirations continue to lead us on new adventures. And while not all our experiences are relevant to all of you, we will always have one thing in common. If you have ever been or are a Benny, please stand up. Bennies, stand up. There's some of you back there in the audience. I, uh, I see you. Look around. Look around. This is part of your network, part of your support system, part of your past, part of your future. Give each other a smile and a wave. I'm not a hugger, so smile, wave. There it is. All right, now you can sit down. Thank you. Here's the truth. There's no roadmap to your life. There's no Siri to tell you to take left at College Avenue. All you can do is embrace your experiences and passions, make decisions, and learn from mistakes. Today I hit on all parts of my life, my work, my family, my friends, they all make me who I am and I bring them all with me every day I go to work, every day I charge the next hill. So here's my sage advice. It's the same advice I wanna give my seven-year-old daughter, Jackson Marie, sitting right over there watching this speech. Jackson, graduates, think critically, lead courageously, advocate passionately. Do that, Bennies, and you will lead an exceptional life. Thank you.